We've been looking at the character of Peter. And today we're going to continue our study of these apostles and continue specifically our study with Peter. And there are so many, so many good stories uh, about Peter in the Bible that we can learn so much from. I mean, we talked earlier about really he and Paul really are the, uh, the most written about human earthly characters uh, in the Bible. Obviously, it's about Jesus, and he is the central character of the entire Bible. But man, there are, some, there are some fantastic stories and lessons. And today I want to look at the story of Peter and James, uh, I'm sorry, Peter and John and the lame man as they uh, go into the temple here in Acts chapter 3. So we're going to start out in Acts chapter 3 and read verses 1 through 16. I'll read if you'll follow along. Acts chapter 3 verses 1 through 16. It says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength, and he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we made this man to walk? The God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up, and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof ye are witnesses. And his name, his name, through faith, it, I'm sorry, his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray you would bless as we study this passage this evening. I pray you would speak to our hearts and encourage us and give us something that we can take away and, and use. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I, I love the, the fact that this passage goes on to say that as a result of this message, as a result of you know what he started preaching here, and we didn't go through the entire message, it, it continues on through the passage here, but it says that there were 5,000 that heard the word of God and believed. And that's amazing that as a direct result of what happened with this lame man and how the Lord healed him, this opportunity to preach, there were this many people that were saved. And again, it's kind of like those stories of the feeding of the 5,000. It says there were 5,000 men. So there were probably, I have, I have my doubts that there were 5,000 men and no women and no children accepted Christ as their Savior. So there were, there were many, I'm certain, that were beyond that, that trusted Christ as their Savior. And afterwards, again, as a result of this message, we see that, that Peter and uh, John were arrested, put in, in hold, the Bible says, in prison, basically. And they later had another opportunity to preach to the council uh, the next day. But the passage opens up here with Peter uh, healing this lame man. And more than healing, we see him, of course, proclaiming faith in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, that was the, the essence of this. The story doesn't say explicitly at the beginning that he shared the gospel, that he went through the gospel presentation, but we see that he says, how did this happen? 
It happened through faith. We read in that last verse. And his name, talking about Jesus, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong. So he says, hey, it was this man's faith in Jesus Christ. It was something that he had said to them, obviously, that was not put in that first portion of the passage. But it was his faith in Jesus Christ. And we see here that Peter was going about his daily life, and he took an opportunity to evangelize this lame man that was sitting by the temple. And this evangelism and his taking an opportunity in his daily life later led to him having a much greater opportunity to share the gospel with thousands upon thousands and see, like we said here, 5,000 men that trusted Christ. And the one lesson that I want to highlight this evening, and there are so many stories, so many things that we can get out of each of these stories, but the one thing I want to highlight this evening is that it is imperative that we take every opportunity possible to share the gospel. It's a simple thing, but I think we're going to look at several aspects of this today. It's imperative that we take every opportunity that we're presented with to share the gospel. Some people throw around this, this term, we've probably heard it before, lifestyle evangelism. How many of you have heard this term before, lifestyle evangelism? You know, and I'll tell you what, at the surface, it sounds good. I believe that our, our lifestyle should be an aid to us as we evangelize, as we share the gospel, as we uh, witness to people. But most of the time when this term lifestyle evangelism is used, uh, it, if you look it up, I looked it up and put a definition here. It says, an evangelism strategy that focuses on living a holy, winsome life among unbelievers with the goal of attracting people to the message of Jesus Christ. And at its surface, it sounds good. You know, our lives are a testimony. We understand in the scripture. Our lives can support the message that we preach or it can detract from it. A preacher that, that does not live the right lifestyle when he gets up and preaches truth, it's undermined by the life that he lives, the way that he actually deals with people and, and lives. We understand that our lives can turn people toward or away from the gospel. They can look at us and our demeanor and the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, and it can cause them to turn to Christ or not. But our lifestyle alone is not enough. And I want to be clear that, that when it comes to lifestyle evangelism, it's good, to, and it's, it's good in supporting the sharing of the gospel, but our lifestyle alone is not enough. The Bible commands that we preach the gospel. And what Peter did here was not lifestyle evangelism. I want to use a term here uh, this evening, and you might call this the title of the message, called all-day evangelism. All-day evangelism. That doesn't mean 24 hours necessary. You can't go to sleep or anything like that. But what I mean is the idea that we ought to be preaching, searching for opportunities, watching for opportunities to share the gospel wherever we are throughout the day. That doesn't mean that we, we live a, a certain life and expect people to ask us, but we are preaching the gospel. You might call it habitual evangelism. But in any case, what, what was happening here was actually evangelism. It was Peter sharing the gospel, calling this man to faith, and through his faith, we saw the Lord work not just in his heart and his life, but we saw him work, in, the Lord work in his um, physical body. I love the fact that when he got his strength in his feet and ankle bones, you know, he stood up and, and the Bible talks about him leaping multiple times. It says at the beginning of the verse, at the end of the verse, you know, he, he didn't want to just walk around. He wanted to test the strength in his legs. He got up and he was jumping up and down. I, I, I hope you kind of get into the story here and you picture, but this man who was lame, sitting at the, the uh, entrance to the temple, the gate there, was healed, and he started jumping around. And, and that was quite a spectacle. And the Bible says that there were a number of people that, that gathered together, and, and also it says that he wouldn't let, uh, he wouldn't let uh, Peter and John go. Verse 11, as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them. So not only is he getting up and he's jumping around, but Peter and John, I'm sure they have their obligations in the temple, and there was a reason that they had come, but he, he's holding them. He's, he's keeping them, and I don't think he meant anything bad by it. He was just excited about the blessing that he had received. But today, I want to look at some of the challenges. I want to look at the process and some of the results from this all-day evangelism that we see here in the life of Peter and what he's doing and witnessing to this lame man and the people around. First of all, I want to look at the challenges. There are some challenges. It's not an easy thing to go through your life and every area of your life share the gospel. The, Satan doesn't want us to do that. 
our flesh pulls us back. And as we look at this story, we can see several areas that this was a specific challenge. The first one I want to notice is in verse 1. It says here, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. Now we see here that he was with a friend. He was with another believer. And you say, wait, that, that's got to be an advantage, right? When it comes to sharing the gospel, when it comes to witnessing to people. And it can be, but it's not always. You know, there are times when you may be with another believer. And you, you may wonder, well, well, whose responsibility is it? Is, is he going to give him a track? Is, is he going to give him a track? Is it mine? Who's going to step up? I don't want to, you know, and, and sometimes because we're with friends, it can make it harder. Maybe even there's still a, a bit of peer pressure. You may be worried about what they might think as you share the gospel. And we have to be careful that as we're walking through daily life, we don't let the people that we're with affect our sharing of the gospel. We don't worry about who we share the gospel in every opportunity sometimes the hardest time to share the gospel is with a friend we're already concerned about how we're perceived and how it's received and you bring another person into the mix it it makes it more difficult but peter here didn't care that james was with him or john he didn't care what john thought he didn't wait for john to step up and share the gospel himself he went ahead and took the opportunity that he had and we have to be careful that we don't let friends keep us from sharing the gospel now, sometimes the hardest people to share the gospel with can even be people that we know well. When you share the gospel and you go out and knock on a door, I don't know how it is for others, but I'm, I trust it in some manner. It's similar to me. A rejection from a random person that I meet out soul winning is not as hard as a rejection from my mother. I mean, I'm just picking a, a person, someone that I love, someone that's care close to me. And, and if I knock on a door and the person that I don't know haven't spent five minutes with slams the door on me you know i might i'm not going to say i enjoy it but you know you, you walk onto the next door and it doesn't hit you the same way but if you share the gospel with a co-worker someone that you spend every day with all day at work you sp sh share the gospel with somebody that you go spend all day at school with you sh share the gospel with somebody that that you have to spend a car ride in that you're giving a you know uber ride to or, or whatever you know you have to spend time with them that rejection can be something that is uh, is more difficult and we have to be careful that we don't let the rejection of people that we encounter and spend time with uh, affect us in a greater in a greater way people are going to reject us it, it's a it's a normal thing for all sorts of ridiculous reasons I, I got a message on our church facebook page today and they were telling us that we needed to pay taxes <laughs> and i don't know where that came from whatever you know and i assume they're referring to property taxes because a lot of churches you know they don't have that obligation um but here we we don't get out of that here because we pay rent and they obviously pay their taxes here so uh, anyways all i'm saying is that people have these ridiculous rejections and if we're not careful when we when we are ministering to people that are close to us that we see every day in our daily lives we can take that a lot harder and it can be something that keeps us from sharing the gospel that's a challenge uh number two let's look in verse two Remember, so number one, we said we have to be careful that we don't let being with friends and people that we know keep us from sharing the gospel. Number two, in verse two, it says, And a certain lame man from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple. That's what I want to focus on, that word daily there. It's a person that was there every day. And it's so easy as we go through our daily lives, when we encounter that same situation repeatedly, over and over again it's so easy for us to skip over and in our mind just not even think of sharing the gospel with somebody this was a situation they had surely gotten used to they had uh probably encountered the same man yesterday and the day before and and when we encounter these situations where we see the same people the same situations it's easy to glance right past that person because we're used to it and a challenge here we have to make sure that we do not let the mundane and the normal cause us to forget that each person has a soul and is precious to God. It's a hard thing to do, but if we ask the Lord, and if we're walking yielded to the Holy Spirit, I believe that he will convict our hearts. And there will be people that our minds will glance over. Our, and I'll tell you, I don't believe it's a conscious thing. I don't believe that you purposefully, you know, well, he doesn't even, I don't believe you try to ignore people, but our minds sometimes have a hard time. But the Holy Spirit, if we're yielded to the Holy Spirit, will prompt us. And it may be someone that, You've walked past a hundred times, and the Lord says, what about that person? 
What about that beggar? What about that person? And, and works in our hearts. We have to be careful that we don't let the mundane and the normal keep us from sharing the gospel. Let's look in verse 3, 4, and 5 then as we move forward. It says, Who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. So we see in this passage, and what I want to focus on, is that there are some preset expectations as we're walking through our normal lives. When we go out and knock doors, and this is part of the great thing about taking a specific time and sharing the gospel, dedicating it to uh, going soul winning, there, that is your focus. That's what you're working on. There, there's no uh, distractions. But when you're in your normal daily routine, there are expectations. There are things that people uh, are doing, other priorities. And Peter and James here, they, are, they were headed to, I'm sorry, Peter and John. I keep saying Peter and James. Peter and John, they're headed to the temple. They obviously had some sort of reason they were headed there. I don't believe that they were headed there that day, based on the reading of the story, for this blind man or this uh, lame man. I don't think that Peter woke up that day and said, you know what we need to do? We need to go to the temple and we need to share the gospel with this lame man. And then we're going to go ahead and share the gospel and see 5,000 saved and end up in jail tonight. I don't think that that was the plan of events that he had lined up for the day. I think that when he came there, he was just planning to continue and do ministry like he normally would, whatever it was, lead in prayer at the temple, uh, share the gospel uh, with people that were there. I don't know exactly what his um, work and what his duty was there at the temple, but I doubt it included the lame man. He had schedule obligations. He had other priorities. Uh, it tells us here that it was time for them to be at the temple for the hour of prayer. This ninth hour would have been about mid-afternoon, the ninth hour after sunrise. And uh, there were most certainly leaders that were, they were leaders that were expected to be in their place, but they didn't let that stop them from taking the time to minister to this lame man. And I'll tell you, wherever you are in life, every person has obligations of some sort. Maybe you need to be at work. Maybe you have someone you're meeting, an appointment. Maybe you have a task that you're trying to accomplish. We have goals in our lives, priorities, but we cannot let these things stop us from sharing the gospel. We, we cannot let them take priority over sharing the gospel. Now, I'm not saying that you should be habitually late and then use this as an excuse. Well, I was sharing the gospel again. Well, we know, you know, Brother George, he's never going to be on time because he's always, you know. No, no, that's not what we're talking about. You still are setting up your life with a schedule, trying to accomplish things and work. But we cannot let those priorities keep us from sharing the gospel and being soul conscious. So we see these challenges. The uh, We see the being with a friend. We see being in the mundane. We see that these expectations um, and, and schedule obligations, I, I kind of jumped in and put these two things together, but um, schedule obligations, <laughs> Peter and John went to the temple together. They, they had something that they had to do there. But then also, when it comes to expectations, I broke this up and I jumped ahead in my notes. Uh, this man, when they came to him, he asked them for something. Did he ask them for healing? No. He didn't, did he ask them uh, to teach him about Jesus Christ and you know what was required for salvation? No. He had other expectations. And when we go through our daily life, especially, sometimes we knock on a door and people will say, well, there's got to be more. What, what are they coming here for to share? But when we're walking through our daily life and we stop a, maybe a, a store checkout person, there is an expectation for what happens in that interaction. There's the expectation that you put your stuff up on the... On the what do you call it, the sliding table there, and it goes through, and they scan it, they put it in the bags, you give them the money, and you move on. There's people that are waiting in line behind you. There's an expectation for what happens. And whenever we break that expectation, uh, it can be a socially awkward thing. It can, be, uh, it can be a difficult thing. But we have to understand that we don't live according to the world's expectations. They don't have the same priorities that we have. They don't have the same understanding of, of what is important and what is not. And, and this man... He asked for money. He asked for, for alms. He didn't ask for healing. He didn't ask for forgiveness. He expected James, I'm sorry, John and Peter to give the, the alms, the money, and move on. That was what everyone else probably did. I say everyone else, those that, that gave to him. And that was his expectation. And we have to make sure that we don't just live according to the expectations of people around us. 
That is not to say that we're rude. You consider the fact that there are people behind you in the drive-thru. You don't sit there and give them a 20-minute gospel presentation while there's you know, a line full behind you at Burger King. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is don't be afraid to break the expectations to share the gospel, to give someone a track, to ask a person a question that reminds them of eternity and that one day they're going to stand before God. So here are these challenges for everyday evangelism, all-day evangelism. Number one, we're often with people that we're going to interact with later. We need to make sure we don't let that keep us from it. Number two, we're often in situations that are repeated, that it's easy to overlook people. We have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit working in our hearts and lives and directing us to people. We have to be aware of preset expectations and not just living according to what other people expect us to say and do. And then also we mentioned, and it's along the same lines, this idea of schedule expectations, making sure that we don't let you know, our priorities and our work and the schedule that we have keep us from sharing the gospel. So we understand some of the challenges here. How did Peter do this? I, and man, time is flying. Our time, our time is going by quickly here. I'm going to go ahead and, and I, I know I'm not going to be able to finish the notes that I have here because we we're going to look at the process of how to do this. We're going to look at the results and what he did, but I'm going to look quickly at this process. How did he do this? First of all, he saw. He looked. He noticed a person in need. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 4. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 4. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 4, it says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Now, there's a lot of things this, this can be you know, misconstrued, but if we look at the context, we understand this is talking about service to others, looking at meeting other people's needs in the same way that Jesus Christ did when he came to earth and he served as well. We have to be careful that we don't get so wrapped up in the things that we're doing that we don't lift up our eyes and look at the people around us. And I know it seems like an obvious thing, but the very first thing that happened here was he saw this man. This man that so many others just gave money to and, and moved on that people, I assume, probably had not shared the gospel with him clearly in the past. But Peter saw a person in need. Matthew 9 and verse 36 says of Jesus, it says, But when he saw the multitudes... He was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Even Jesus Christ, God himself, as he's in his robe of flesh here on this earth, he was affected by what he saw. And, and we too, it is so easy for us to, to go through life and, and miss things. We have to use our eyes to see people. Nowadays, you know, this world has us separated from people. They don't want us to have those relationships. Or it's so easy to just stay in your house and stay locked up and order your groceries in and have your food delivered and never interact with people, never see people. But in order for Peter to share the gospel with this, with this man, first of all, he had to see. And I'm not going to continue on this today. Man, I, I want to <laughs> get excited about it. But I, the first thing, if there's anything I can encourage you today, when it comes to this all-day evangelism, when it comes to sharing the gospel, we talked about some of the challenges. This week, focus on seeing people, looking for people that are in need. When you see your chiropractor, that's not just a person who is there to serve you, but that's a person that you can serve. And I'll tell you, it's so easy for you to go in there, just make the typical small talk, let them do the thing that they do, you know, you know, crack you, pop you, whatever you do, and, and head out of there. But you need to see people. And, and if we see people and we understand that that person is a soul in need of salvation. It'll affect our everyday or all day evangelism here. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this example that we see here in Peter and John. And I pray you please help us to, to look in our own lives. And I pray you'd help us to follow his example. Lord, I pray you'd help us to be aware of these challenges and the, the struggles that we deal with as we walk through our daily lives, and do not let these things take priority and stop us from sharing the gospel. Lord, I pray you would help us to be a soul-conscious church. I pray you'd help us to see opportunities. I pray you'd help us to listen to the Holy Spirit as we go through our daily lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.